I'm going to tell you about a real life incident of a hostage situation within a high secure unit. So what happened? What was the motivation of this particular hostage taker? What is a high secure psychiatric unit? What levels of violence versus risk for patients are sectioned there? And what are the usual security measures? Plus, as a little bonus, what is the diagnosis of dangerous and severe personality disorder? Is it valid? Hello, cruel world. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living so that you don't have to. Welcome to my channel, A Psych for Sore Minds. Grab your list of demands, sit back, relax. I educate whilst you renovate. I mean, sorry. I educate whilst you vegetate. So let's start off with the actual incident itself. This is a story all about how life on a ward got flipped upside down. This incident uh, happened in 2006 in Brampton Hospital, and that is one of four high secure hospitals, psychiatric hospitals in the UK, and it's based in Nottinghamshire, and it has just under 400 patients. I will tell you a bit more about high secure hospitals later. The perpetrator was a male patient with a long history of very disturbed behavior within high secure hospitals and within prisons. He resided resided on a specialist ward for dangerous and severe personality disorder. What is interesting is that is not a clinical diagnosis, but it's a political one. A lot of resources went into trying to treat this supposed diagnosis, but that might be another story for another video. Let me know in the comments section if you want to know more about this, but very briefly, the reason I say it's political rather than clinical is because the UK government decided that some people were so dangerous that they shouldn't be in the community. Therefore, they locked them up indefinitely, even after they served their prison sentences. So it's kind of similar to an IPP, which is an indeterminate prison sentence. I've talked about this earlier in my previous video about Joseph McCann. If you're into true crime, you'll love that video. Uh, it details this horrendous crime spree, one of the worst in British history. I talk you through his motivations, etc. Go chiggity, 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 check it out. So it might sound to you, to the layperson, to be justifiable to lock people up if they are a continuing danger to society, but the essence of the problem with the DSPD unit was that these people are being kept in psychiatric unit, where the whole ethos is about treatment and rehabilitation with the purpose of discharging them into the community. If you're just locking them up, then basically you're using a lot of resources, which is very expensive compared to locking them up in prison, for example. So to kind of put this into perspective for you, dear viewers, to give you a slightly glib but equivalent comparison for me, that would be the same as taking all the GPs which are family doctors for our foreign viewers, away from their practices and getting them to try and treat terminally ill patients. Terminally ill patients can't be cured and therefore you're wasting the talents and the resources and the skills of those GPs. That doesn't mean the terminally ill patients shouldn't get support and care, but it should be in an appropriate environment such as a hospice. And if you didn't do that, you'd be taking the GP away from patients who needed them. That's basically what happened. And there was a pilot program for the treatment of individuals with dangerous and severe personality disorder. It was established in 2000 the one it was very expensive it didn't work particularly well it was very controversial as i said let me know in the schmum and schmection below if you want to know more anyways back to our perpetrator <clears throat> by the way this is all from an article in the journal of forensic psychiatry and psychology edition 24.1 published on the 19th of december 2012 i will get my editor to put the links below and it talked about four different instances of real life hostage taking in Ram in rampton hospital but i picked the juiciest one because i love you guys you're kind of like my children children to me, although you're not as cute as my children and you will not get my inheritance. What I thought was quite interesting is this article didn't have the names of any of the perpetrators and that is presumably because they're still detained and still sectioned under the Mental Health Act and due to patient confidentiality you can't talk about your patients. That's why I never name my real life patients, I always give them pseudonyms. So let's do that for this guy. Let's call the perpetrator, the hostage taker, Mr. Magic. By the way, if you want to know more about confidentiality, check out my episode on when psychiatrists are allowed to break confidentiality, or if they are, spoiler alert, they are, but only in very extreme circumstances. Okay, back to our case. Early one evening, Mr. Magic pressed the cell bell in his bedroom, and when a staff member attended, he had had taken another patient, let's call him Mr. Bird, was sat on a chair and Mr. Magic was holding him in a headlock with a pen to his throat. So it might not seem like a very dangerous situation, but remember, the pen is mightier 
than the sword. And Mr. Magic said that he would kill the victim if the staff approached him and he requested for the police to be summoned so that he could be arrested because apparently the perpetrator and the victim were observed laughing together initially. However, as time passed and this incident progressed, the perpetrator became more threatening and the victim, Mr. Bird, claimed that he was even made, and I kid you not, to drink his own urine at one point. Although it could be worse, could have been forced to drink Foster's. This was the most serious hostage incident to ever have occurred in Rampton Hospital. Can you guess, dear viewers, how long this stand-up was for? I'll be impressed if you get close answers later on in this episode. So after several hours of negotiating, the perpetrator was taken into the intensive care unit and locked in the seclusion room. So he didn't get his wish, didn't go back to prison. I'll explain what both of those things are, intensive care unit within high secure hospitals and seclusion room later on in this episode. Yvonne Bay. <laughs> Mr. Magic had a pattern of disturbed behavior before this. So it's usually in the form of regular self-harm and there were three episodes of physical violence. One involved grabbing a patient by the throat and on two occasions he'd thrown punches at another man's head. He wasn't physically violent towards staff at the hospital, though there'd been some threats and some verbal aggression. There'd reportedly been the buildup of about six months of increased agitation in Mr. Magic. And for days before the incident, he was heard on the telephone talking in code about how he's trying trying a strategy to move away from the hospital because he wanted to go back to prison and he said he would do anything to achieve this. It emerged that Mr. Magic had been walking around the ward asking other patients if they'd be willing to be taken hostage. So I knew there was honour amongst thieves, but who knew there was such thing as etiquette amongst kidnappers. Mr. Magic felt uncared for and he also felt boredom. In the words of the great philosopher Slick Rick, Au revoir, back to dating mutts and stars, at least for now no more accumulating cuts and scars behind bars. Dum diddy dum diddy diddy daddy day. This type of stuff happens every day. Anyways, Mr. Magic was bored in the hospital, leading him to negatively ruminate about his whole situation. He wanted to return to prison and he didn't want feast treatment forced on him. There's qu I've got quite a few interesting theories on why some people much prefer prison to hospital and vice versa. I don't have enough time to go into it now, but if you're interested, I can do a different video on that with a case example, as always. Let me know in the Shmormich Metro below. Okay, so the victim, Mr. Bird, said that he volunteered as he wanted to attract sympathy and possibly because he wanted to move ward, but as time passed, he became more frightened and felt more threatened as the incident went on. So, dear viewers, I asked you before, can you guess how long the standoff was for? Drum roll, please. It was 19 hours. So if you guessed within two hours either side, well done, I'm proud of you. Go buy yourself a cookie and you can bill me. You Bombay. Other infrequent serious incidents that might occur in a high secure unit, the ones that really sort of scare the psychiatrists like myself are escape or absconsion, same thing, or homicides and suicides. Now, I know you, I know your morbid curiosity, I know your goth-like tendencies. So if you want examples of all of the above, I got you, man. So I've done videos on all of those things. <clears throat> I've done a video on John Straffen, who's a man who escaped Broadmoor in the 50s and horrifically went on to kill a random, very young girl for no reason nearby. I've done videos on suicide within Broadmoor. So that's David Gonzalez. He killed himself with a CD. Go check out that video. And I've done not one, not three, but two different videos on real life patients who have killed within Broadmoor High Secure Unit. Their names are <clears throat> Peter Bryan, who's the Broadmoor cannibal, and Robert Moore. Maudsley, who's a serial killer. Go chiggity chiggity check those videos if you're interested in that kind of thing. Robert Maudsley in particular was a horrific incident. He and another man tortured their victim for several hours many years ago. And also if you're interested in a siege in a medium secure unit, so an actual siege that happened in 2015, I've got another video on this channel. I actually previously worked in that unit in East London. Always be plugging man, always be plugging. You Bombay. <laughs> So next question is, what kind of patient goes to a high secure unit? What's the threshold of violence for them to be accepted in this unit? Nice juicy question for you. Before I answer, let me introduce you to this channel. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess and rehabilitate mentally disordered offenders in court 
and in prisons and in psychiatric units. I am your favorite British Asian forensic psychiatrist with a gold tooth based in London, definitely in your top five. This channel covers a whole range. It's a smorgasbord of issues related to offending and mental illness and the crossroads between the two. Uh, I talk about individual diagnoses, high profile cases with my own psychoanalysis. Um, basically I do a lot of stuff and you gotta go check it out. And I implore you to please subscribe because not only does it help me out immeasurably, but it actually reduces earwax. Sorry, I said it actually reduces earwax. Okay, back to this video. What kind of patient goes to a high secure unit? What's the threshold? Well, it's kind of taken on a case by case basis, but when I worked at Broadmoor, there was actually an admissions panel. So there was a bunch of psychiatrists who would go through all the referrals, which is basically all the requests from prisons or other hospitals to have people come to Broadmoor to decide if patients were dangerous enough to cross the threshold. And not only that, but who was the most dangerous on the list that had to come in first. One of the most important factors is do they have a mental illness because the whole point of high secure hospitals is not they're not prisons it's not for containment or punishment it's to rehabilitate and treat so they need to have an established mental illness commonly schizophrenia bipolar affective disorder psychotic depression sometimes personality disorder these are the kinds of diagnoses that my patients have just to be crystal clear i'm not suggesting for a minute that most people with these mental illnesses are violent or commit offenses that's absolutely not the case but as a forensic psychiatrist the patients that i see have these illnesses and do commit violence so the technical term for high secure services or the technical threshold is for those presenting with and i quote a grave and imminent danger so my experience is it has to be a very severe level of violence such as multiple murders or serial rapists from my experience usually it's not just one murder so one murder wouldn't be enough generally speaking to get somebody into a high secure unit there are exceptions so if it was particularly brutal if they like i don't know decapitated somebody or set them on fire for example, then that might be an exception. But generally, if it's a, uh, I don't know what the right terminology, if it's a typical, normal, bland murder, like a stabbing, those people would go to medium secure units, not to high secure units. As well as violence, occasionally there are other presentations that would send somebody to high secure, such as if even if their index offense wasn't that serious, if they keep committing violence in a medium secure unit and that secure unit doesn't have the resources to contain the violence, then they might escalate to high secure or even if they're not physically violent, they set a lot of fires, and those fires are obviously dangerous in a hospital, so then they might escalate from medium to high secure, or if they escape a lot, so if they're like Murdoch from the A-team and they're constantly trying to leave the hospital, you might need a higher level of security to maintain them and to contain them, so that would be another reason for them to go to high secure. Whew. So, here's an ultimate question. What is a high secure hospital? What's the purpose? What's the function? What's the ethos? Well, as I've already alluded to, they look after the most dangerous and risky psychiatric patients, those with a history of extreme violence. And as I said before, they're not a prison. They're there for rehabilitation and they're there ultimately with the aim of discharging people back into community by treating their mental illness, either directly from high secure or more commonly to step down from high secure to medium secure than the community if they need long-term treatment medium secure to low secure community. So everybody that goes in there is sectioned under the Mental Health Act, usually a criminal section. They have like a care plan. They're regularly seen by psychiatrists such as myself, nurses, uh, psychologists, etc. So the point I'm trying to make is, is that there's a big engine, there's a big machine of rehabilitation. They're not just dangerous people that get kept there for no reason indefinitely. There are four high secure units in the UK. There's the most infamous one is probably Broadmoor, which is in Berkshire. I worked there myself as a registrar as part of my training about seven or eight years ago before I became a consultant forensic psychiatrist. There is Rampton, where Mr. Magic kidnapped Mr. Bird. That's in Nottinghamshire. I've never worked there regularly, but I have carried out a couple of assessments as one-off assessments for the court there. Then there's Ashworth High Secure Hospital, which is in Mer Merseyside. All right, buddy, all right, calm down, calm down. And then finally, there's Carstairs, which is located in South Lancashire in central Scotland. There's been a murder. And I actually visited Carstairs many, many years ago when I was a medical student, because I actually went to Edinburgh Medical School that was 
a thousand years ago. Okay, this is gonna blow your mind. Can you guess, dear viewer, how much it costs to keep a patient in a high secure hospital for one year? Answers later on in this episode, it will make your eyes water and it will make you shit your little panties, guaranteed or your money back. It is, really is mind blowing. Obviously, <clears throat> there's a high level of security in these hospitals. For example, all staff members have keys. You have to have like a, th a thumb scanner to release the keys that's specifically for you. Keys must be attached to belts at all times. They can't be lost or stolen. So not too dissimilar to a prison, I guess. There are huge, huge gates in these high secure hospitals. There are fences, there are locked doors, there are snipers in the towers. Only kidding. Uh, but there is airport style searches for all staff members for every single shift that go into the hospital. Even regular senior respected, you know, staff members, they have to be searched fully every time. There are also CCTV cameras, at least in Broadmoor, within the hospital. And these security staff are employed to watch the cameras at all times to make sure that there's no kind of violence going on. And staff have like radios to contact each other. For example, if a ward is going out to the on-site cafe, then all the staff are aware of the movements of all the patients. You don't want too many patients congregating in one area. The wards themselves are designed and laid out to minimize risk. So for example, there are long corridors and there are huge windows in the nurses station, which are like fish bowls in the middle so that nurses can see all the patients. So everyone's in the line of sight, no hidden corners, for example. There are also little kind of hatches in individual bedrooms so the nurses can open the windows and peer into the bedrooms. So so that they can, you know, uh, keep it. They can observe the patients. Another security measure is that all the toilets can be locked from the outside in case, you know, somebody takes somebody in there to hurt them or committing self-harm, for example. Obviously, it doesn't take a genius to realize that all these things I'm talking about come at a cost, and that cost is, a, is the privacy to the patient. But as I say, to be in high secure hospital, you have to be such high risk anyway that you're a risky individual by definition. Otherwise, you wouldn't be there. Other types of security measures include regular urine drug screens, staff carry alarms in case they're attacked, and all staff are trained in Kung Fu. Actually, that's not true, but it's kind of true. We actually have violence prevention strategies that's taught annually. We're actually literally taught restraints and holds. If you're interested in learning more about that, see my video on control and restraint breakaway techniques that are taught to staff members. That video also covers the tragic case of Rocky Bennett, who's a man who was killed in a medium secure unit in Norwich due to a prolonged physical uh, restraint by some staff. On top of everything I've mentioned, patients are observed and they're checked in on regularly, including throughout the night shifts. But there's different levels even within the high security of, of um, severity of illness and level of risk. So depending on the presentation of the, of the patient, the higher risk category are sent on things like the intensive care unit, which I spoke about before, and there's a higher staff to patient ratio. In the past, security has been very slack. Probably the most high profile, astonishing case of that would be Jimmy Savile. So he had his own keys in Broadmoor, as you might have heard, which to me is just mind-blowingly ridiculous. Considering he wasn't even a clinician, so everyone else has to be escorted. Visitors are never given keys, so the fact that Jimmy Savile has them is just all the more bizarre. In fact, even members of staff often have to be vetted for several months before they get their own keys. Okay, dear viewers, I asked you before if you can guess how much it costs to keep a patient in a high secure unit for one year. The answer is, drum roll please, £275,000 a year. That's how much it costs. That's the equivalent of 370,000 US dollars. It's also the equivalent of my annual budget for parking tickets. So why is it so expensive? Well, the facilities themselves and the actual buildings, plus like, you know, the, the safe furniture, furniture can't be picked up, um, like windows that don't open a certain way. So all the equipment, the entire building itself is kind of custom made. Plus you've got locked magnetic doors, CCTV cameras, and a lot of staff, including specialist professionals. So all of these things add up, that's why it's so expensive. In the words of the great philosopher, Aristotle, cash rules everything around me, cream, get the money, dollar dollar bill, you're. So I mentioned before that Mr. Magic was taken to the intensive care unit and he was put in seclusion. What are these things and how are they used? I mentioned this before, but the intensive care unit is like the highest level of security of risk within the high secure unit, smaller number of patients, highest input, highest support, probably highest doses of medications, lots of observation plus therapy. Basically, they're always being observed by nurses. Patients can be moved to this intensive care unit temporarily if they're deteriorating, for example, if their medications are not working, or if they are after a very risky event. 
just like what happened to Mr. Magic, such as severe assault, hostage taking. I, when I worked in Broadmoor, it was in a similar ward to this, and most patients were kept in long-term seclusion, which is unlike the rest of the patients, because as I keep saying, the ethos is to treat and rehabilitate, not to contain. But these patients are so high risk, they have to be contained. So I keep mentioning seclusion. What is seclusion? Seclusion rooms are not just in high secure units, but they're also in medium secure and even occasionally low secure music. They're basically a locked cell where, where the patient is too unsafe to be let out into the ward. So the patient's kept in this room. It's kind of like, I suppose, the modern version of the antiquated construct of a padded cell. Contrary to popular belief, it's not for the long term and patients are not set there for punishment but they're kept there until they're deemed to be safe enough to return on the ward and when the imminent threat of violence has gone. So to give you some examples, instances I've seen include patients hearing voices, telling them to attack people, or specific paranoid delusions about uh, members of staff. Patients very agitated if there's an immediate sense of violence. Usually people are kept in seclusion for a couple of days, maybe a week, very rarely longer than this. Sometimes when they're released, they go straight to one-to-one -one observation, so they have a nurse following them around, again, in the short term, just to make sure they're safe. Obviously that is very resource heavy and it stops nurses from caring from other patients. It's not an ideal situation. You Bombay! So let's wrap things up. I'm a very busy man. In conclusion, in this episode, I told you about the real life case of a hostage incident of uh, two men named Mr. Magic and Mr. Bird, not their real names, obviously, in 2006. We discussed the ethos and the purpose and the function of high secure units. We talked about the fact that it's a common misconception that they're prisons, but they're not prisons, and they're there to rehabilitate. We learned about the very expensive security measures. We learned that you have a problem with earwax. We learned that patients have to be sectioned there due to their level of violence, and it's usually multiple murders or serial rapes. I also taught you about the usual security measures. We talked about the diagnosis of dangerous and severe personality disorder and how it was controversial and it was a political rather than clinical. It was a huge waste of money. As I said before, if you want to know more about that, tell me in the Shramich Mechshrams below. Okay, but was there anything else? Ah, of course, my book, my bookie, bookie, bookie. Go cop it, it's gonna be dope. It's gonna be called Into Minds, released in March 2022 by Sphere Publishing. It's a bit like this channel, but a lot more of a deep dive, a lot more personal, a bit more autobiographical. I talk much more about my own personal cases and the impact they had on me. Gotta go check it out. I implore you to help me get more subscribers because I'm a very shallow man and I need reassurance and I need love. And the only way that I recognize love is through YouTube subscribers and to a lesser degree likes. Please tell your favorite people and your worst enemies about this channel. They deserve it, spread the love. Until next time, stay euthymic and whatever happens, please, please don't forget, I love you.